All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. And I'm going to hand the microphone over to our presenter for the day, Neil Henderson, coach and founder of Apex Coaching and Consulting in Boulder, Colorado. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, Joe. It's uh, great to be here in Boulder at the Leomo Performance Center, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you a bit of information about uh, how we've been using the Leomo Type R and LBS to improve cycling and specifically a bit more on time trial performance. A little background about me, uh, I have been working in endurance sports for quite a long time. That means I'm kind of old. I did volunteer with the first national teams for triathlon way back in 1996. For those of you who are old enough to know, you'll realize that triathlon did not enter the Olympic program until the year 2000. And so uh, that's when things were really getting going. So I have been around for a little while uh, and uh, starting off more in, in triathlon and with the advent of cycling power meters and things, started to do a whole lot more with cycling and I've had great fortune to work with some fantastic athletes like Taylor Finney and Evelyn Stevens and current riders like Kasha Niwiadoma and uh, current reigning world time trial champion, Rowan Dennis for many years, uh, as well as being part of our Olympic team staff in 2012 and 2016. So as a big picture, uh, as a coach, my goal is to help fast people go faster. Um, and so with that, uh, there's a few things that we look at. Uh, I have a little bit of a philosophy that I've developed over the decades that I've been doing this. Um, I have a, a decent background in laboratory exercise physiology as well as biomechanics um, and there's a big part of what we're able to do with the Leongo system to take the lab out into the field and so integrating the data that we see and being able to couple that with video has been really a game changer for me as a coach so i'm going to show you then some examples of how we integrate the the, the lds system into what we're looking at and see so many many years and many failures have gone into coming up with this algorithm, which as you know, an algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem, problem solving operations. So I kind of use this thought process ultimately to try to help again, these fast people get faster. So training and rest, varying amounts of both, with a modifier by genetics will help develop an individual athlete's capacity to perform. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, your athlete's race day performance is not dictated exclusively or solely by that capacity to perform that you've built up. That actual performance on race day depends upon the execution that the athlete employees as well as the tactics that potentially they employ or potentially that their competitors uh, employ against them. So keep in mind just training well and having a, a wonderfully prepared, prepared athlete in terms of a physical preparation will not necessarily yield a great performance. And so you have to tie all of these things together. When we look at this capacity to perform, I believe it comes from a big array of different factors. We have things that are of physical nature, things in cycling like aerodynamics, muscular strength, muscular endurance. We can go to a physiological aspect, looking at the metabolic capacities, aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity. You can look at the environmental preparation, somebody prepared to race at altitude or in extreme heat, humidity, et cetera. You have nutritional aspects to this capacity. You're fueling hydration, recovery, nutrition, et cetera, the psychological well-being and psychological preparation of your athlete is absolutely critical on race day, especially the higher level of athlete that you work with and, and the higher level of competition that we see. There's also skill development there. We have biomechanical factors, including motor skills, posture, say something like light fit, and then the motion patterns that we have that really, for me, kind of come together in what we, what I call a quality of movement. This quality of movement then is something that we are able to assess, identify, look at weakness, strength, asymmetry. There's aspects of technique that we can look at. Does somebody employ effective movement patterns? If you think about a bicycle, a crank, uh, you have a bottom bracket and the, the crank goes in circles. 
So if you attach your feet to the pedals and go around, your legs will actually go in a circle. It's pretty much impossible to not go in a circle if you're attached to the bicycle. But in doing so, there are a lot of different movements that may be occurring further up the chain, up above your foot, up at the knee, at your hip, at the torso, even at the head. And you can look at some of these things with something like a type R with, with the IMUs, with, with the accelerometers. And so we can assess then weakness, structural deficits, some of those instabilities and what may be associated with those. Asymmetries and differences that we see from left to right can be very prominent. We can also see some of the compensation of what's going on with there. And then we can see changes with increasing load or resistance or power output or combination of those things as well as fatigue over time. As somebody continues to do that circular motion and pedaling, as they fatigue, they may alter their movements. So fit, bicycle fit, your posture and position are all dynamic movement analysis and the Type R is a wonderful tool for being able to do this. For those of you who have not used uh, Type R, I want you to take a look at the uh, pictures down here below because I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the accelerations and uh, the gyro uh, of the IMUs that we place in the set, that we place in the body. So if, we, if you have a sensor, you can look at it. If you uh, put the little light in the upper left corner as you look at it facing you, the sensor as you go towards the green where you see Y is a positive Y movement for the axis of accelerometer to the right would be a positive x-axis acceleration. And then the z, if we uh, hold the sensor perfectly flat on a table, z would be moving downward. So y would be moving away from you, x would be moving to your right, and z positive would be moving down. So these are accelerations, and when we look at this in the LDS, we're gonna be looking at those accelerations uh, in a, basically relative to G's or gravity, which is a 9.8 meters per second squared rate of acceleration. The gyrometer is then looking at angular accelerations. And so we have then the rotation in degrees per second when we start to talk about the gyro functions. And again, the X axis, we're gonna see a rotation in degrees per second around the x-axis. So to put this in a more simple term, if I put a sensor on my right foot and I'm pedaling a bicycle, as I am moving downwards, the z would be moving in a positive direction, positive acceleration. If I think about the ankle movement, and think about plantar flexion, which is when your toe is moving towards your shin, or plantar flexion, and when your toes are moving away from your shin, that would be describing the x-axis angular acceleration in degrees per second, in degrees per second. So a plantar flexion would be a positive x gyro, reading on the LBS, and a dorsiflexion would be a negative x acceleration, negative degrees per second. We're gonna see that as an example in a little while. I'll, I'll kind of refresh you on that in a few minutes when we get to it. So I've been fortunate to be able to be uh, working with the Leomo system for a couple years. Um, and it took me a little while to, to figure out what I was really looking at. So some part of my process was in working with what I knew, or at least what I thought I knew. Um, I've done a lot of lab testing and we do a lot of baseline testing with our athletes. Um, here are a couple examples in the past year of athletes that we've had in the lab. And in addition to doing some of the standard metabolic measurements, I was gathering their type R data to assess their movement. 
I also uh, practice what I preach. I used to race triathlon at, a, at an elite level many, 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 many years ago, uh, but I still get out there and do some masters racing from time to time. And so I'll also get hooked up in the lab and put myself through the paces and gather all the information as well and try to make sense from what I know about myself and what I know about the lab or what again I think I know um, and what I've seen and, and look at these associations. So in the very beginning, I did some real basic stuff. This is a standard uh, dashboard download of a Leomo type R. So this is actually pre-LVS. So this is going back a few years. Um, but what I was able to look at and see on this were movement patterns changing with fatigue during the kind of VO2 max portion of a test. So we did a steady state kind of lactate profile, a little bit of recovery, and then over on the right hand side here would be the information coming from the VO2 max. And so changes in foot angular range and actual decrease in the pelvic angle during that was something that I observed. Again, this was my data. Interestingly, we took four different athletes here, a mix of U23, uh, road riders, cyclocross riders, and all four of these are four different people doing the same kind of max ramp test. So doing like a one minute ramp to absolute failure. And if we even just look at something like the DSS or dead spot score here, over on the left, the first athlete has a, a fairly noisy DSS, I would say, to some degree. The second athlete, as you move to the right, is actually very clean throughout everything. The third athlete has the absolute biggest dead spot scores of, of all of them during their testing, though it does decrease slightly as they work harder. And then the fourth athlete on the right there is again, uh, a little bit noisy in the early when they're going easy, but as they work harder, we see a bit of a cleaning up. Again, we also see differences then in their foot angular range of motion. We see some consistency in, in pelvic angle tending to de decrease towards that maximum, which actually there's some research out there. Uh, Wendy Holiday out of South Africa has some, some published data on that if you want to look at that um, in an interesting way. But we see certain patterns that may be somewhat consistent but then you also see patterns that are absolutely very individual. Now it's really one of the great uses of this tool. So just taking a deeper dive here, this is one of the uh, U23 athletes. And so we see that pelvic angle decreasing as we move over to the right side during that ramp to max. Here is our very, uh, very, minimal DSS rider, but the stars, as you see here, are shifts in pelvic angle. So after this, we actually talked with the athlete about, you know, how comfortable are they on their saddle? And I said, I hate this saddle. Well, let's, uh, let's do something about that. You shouldn't be on a saddle that you hate if you're trying to ride your bike and uh, be uh, one of the best riders out there. And so we were able to pick up some objective information. Of course, we had to ask her that question as well, but we see this objectively. She's moving around significantly throughout the test and then followed it up uh, with then saddle testing and being able to pull information objectively. Again, I get out there and still race on occasion. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did a stage race where there were three stages. There was basically what I would consider a climb trial. It was a time trial that was a significant uphill portion. So I was on a kind of an aero road bike with clip on aero bars. The second day was a straight up time trial on flat roads. And then the last day was a road race and uh, kind of more of a climbing road race. And if you look at the average power on these, well, the climb trial has the highest average power in the time trial. Uh, it's actually the lowest average power in the first hour of the road race, uh, pretty similar power to the time trial. But if you look at the physiological strain, the average heart rate for the road race was about 16 beats per minute lower than the time trial. So that again is on a different bicycle in a different position. When I looked at that, the, time, the power during the time trial was just extremely low relative to the duration of effort. Being the shortest duration had the lowest power, that didn't really make sense to me as, as it would be that far off. And uh, when I looked at the 
the OMO data, the thing that really jumped out is the difference in average pelvic angle here, what was called pelvic tilt a few years ago. Uh, we now call pelvic angle in, in the Klein trial. The average was 50 degrees, the time trial 36.1 degrees, and then during the road race 54.6. So nearly a 15 to 20 degree difference in pelvic angle was actually uh, causing some reduction or associated with some reduction in power output. Uh, I'm not the brightest guy, but I knew something was not right there and that pelvic angle definitely was an issue. Uh, the, the problem was I was on a bicycle that somebody had given me, an athlete uh, from who had retired, and it had 172 five cranks where I normally ride 170s, and the, the handlebar and pad setup was clearly not appropriately fit to me. So I did what I would uh, normally do and look at the cranks and match things up. Went back down to a 170 crank and then increased the pad height and went out and did some testing. So went out in the test and uh, out into the field and, and did some evaluation. Pelvic angle up from 36.1 now to 41.4 and 40.5 on kind of an out and back test section. And the power output was increased by over 40 watts compared to what that same time trial bike and position was when down at that 36.1 degree. Um, and so there were definitely some, some issues there and uh, was able to use the type R to really objectively find really what was going on. Also had the fortune to, to work with a U23 athlete getting ready for his first uh, U23 uh, Oceania Championships in New Zealand last year. And so we used the type R with one of our coaches um, and, uh, and the athlete here, Jack, to help him learn about his positioning. And we also were able to, to use some data capture and video and, and these are some screen grabs of showing him the impact of some of the uh, things that we do in time trialing the turtle uh, and shrug to reduce frontal area. And so you can see some examples there that, type R data. We've also put sensors on the back of a helmet to look at the angle and being able to see when an athlete is moving during a time trial. That would be, uh, I would say, an off-label use of the type R, and I would recommend you go ahead and do that. Grab one of those and one of those sensors, especially the uh, torso and pelvis sensors are a great setup if you're trying to look at what's happening with head position and place one of them on the back of the helmet. Um, and be able to see what's going on. An athlete who's moving their head excessively is definitely gonna be um, basically wasting energy there. They're gonna be putting that tail up into the wind and uh, increasing their drag, which is not gonna help them time trial faster. So when you look at the dashboard, we have uh, lots of things and there's pretty cool features on the dashboard, especially the comparison. Um, here's an example of being able to compare by selecting a certain duration and certain power output intervals that were completed on three different trainers, three different indoor stationary trainers. One was a Wahoo kicker. One was a rev box, uh, which is kind of a, a low inertia trainer, very light, uh, kind of more fan resistance. And then one was uh, definitely a high, high inertia fan resistance, the Le Mans trainer. And what I was looking at between these three was what are the differences in motion uh, associated with pedaling at a similar power output. And uh, overall, we see, you know, some maybe slight or small differences in DSS, I would say, you know, 0 0.2 versus zero is very small difference. But also looking at the foot angular range, we saw minimal difference. So the actual mechanics were pretty, uh, pretty minimal in the same power output, even though in most cases the athletes may tell you they feel something different. And I wouldn't say that there isn't something different in terms of the feel of, of the inertia, but the actual motion that they are uh, having while riding those three different trainers was very similar. So you can confirm something like that objectively. Now, I still will use these three different trainers to do different things. If I have an athlete trying to do, prepare for time trialing on flat courses uh, where you have a high speed, I am going to use one of the high inertia trainers, either the low or the kicker. If I am having somebody working specifically on climbing, I'm going to use the low inertia climber, uh, low inertia trainer, which would be the rev box to replicate that resistance that you get with climbing 
versus high speed situation. LVS has really kind of opened up the potential for what we can see in incorporating video and then the MPI data and motion data and being able to slow it down to levels that your eye may or may not really be able to pick up. So that ramp test, so MAP, I just, you know, that stands for max aerobic power. Again, kind of a one minute ramp to maximum. Again, coming from an exercise physiology background, that's something that I do a lot in a, in a kind of repeatable objective way of having my athletes do this ramp max protocol and assess how they move. So typically we start around 50% of FTP or threshold power and then increase by 10% of their FTP until failure. Um, often athletes are finishing anywhere between 120 and 160% of their FTP, depending on their training status and the type of athlete they are. So I'm going to show you an example athlete here. Um, this is the data from the type R first, and the ramp itself is going to be kind of the, the middle portion of the data here. If you look at the foot angular range, the kind of orange colors there are fairly stable with maybe just a slight reduction in uh, foot angular range as the intensity increases. We see dead spot score is fairly low throughout with not any dramatic change during. Uh, clearly though, there is a big change in leg angular range going on with this athlete as the intensity increases and pelvic rotation, we see also a significant increase in pelvic rotation and especially pelvic rock. Even looking at this data, I would say, I wonder if this athlete has adequate core strength and stability based on seeing that. So that torso rotation in rock also is profound. If you look in the green, the lower values there, the profound increase in torso rotation and rock just from the, the data here from the type R. But I've been looking at these type R dashboards for many years. If you haven't done that, well, let's take a look at the LVS data. So now we have some of the data here in addition to the video. And we're gonna start off first, just looking at the data. And so the intensity here is up over 400 watts, 420, 430 watts or so, absolutely approaching his absolute maximum effort here is going to be failing uh, fairly soon. So you see now visually with the, day, with the video that clear changes in pelvic rock and rotation and that torso rock and rotation as well. That's something that jumped out to me. Another thing that I wanted to look at then in a little bit more detail was I saw something interesting with his, his foot and specifically looking at a significant degree of dorsiflexion during the pedal stroke, during the downward most forceful phase. And so to look at that, I'm gonna move and slow everything down here. Typically in cycling, to produce the most power, what we want to have coupled hip extension, knee extension, and an ankle plantar flexion. We would typically call that triple extension. That's where we're going to be able to produce the most force into the pedal at any one time. Our example rider here, at the beginning, we can see both the hip extension and knee extension, but there is actually ankle dorsiflexion occurring initially, meaning that there is not all three extension in all three joints, that there is a loss of force and power production when he has that moment of plantar flexion. The visual part, again, if we play that video, you can start to maybe see that the way I look at this within the data then is looking at the right knee acceleration in the Z plane, which is going to be the upper right data plot, and then the right foot 
acceleration in the Z plane. If those two peaks are not synced together at the same time, we are having then that discordance between the knee extension and the knee moving downward and then the foot moving down. And so we see that the actual peaks of those two are not lining up. The other thing that we can pull into that then is the right foot gyro in the X is again going to be showing us dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is going to be the X gyro in a positive direction and dorsiflexion is going to be a negative gyro X movement. So again, if you're seeing a peak of the knee, X acceleration, and you then have negative gyro X, you are having plantar flexion, and so you are losing out on that net force production. So moving as a conclusion from some of this, well, uh, this example, Saita does not have triple extension. Now, what is causing that? I'm not necessarily sure. It may be a weakness in gastroc and soleus. The other thing to notice is he is using a non-round chain ring, which will increase the force production in that two, three, four o'clock position when he is producing the maximum hip and knee force, but is unable to potentially resist that at the ankle due to a lack of potential strength in gastroc and soleus. The first thing that I would do with this person is put them on round chain rings for a week or so, get them used to riding on round chain, round chain rings, and then put them back on the ramp to maximum and assess and look for changes. So again, the takeaway is looking at uncoupled knee Z plane acceleration and foot Z plane acceleration. You can also combine that then with the foot X plane gyro, X axis gyro, sorry. Moving to a bit higher power production here, we have uh, Fukaya, one of, uh, one of the Japanese Kieran racers, and if you look at the power output, he's in excess of 1400 watts. This is a 15 second maximal sprint on the special, uh, special Kieran rollers. You're not gonna do this on a regular set of rollers. These are gonna set you back a little something uh, more than your regular rollers in terms of trying to get, get those. But the power production and motion here, you know, we see the power is absolutely immense. Here at a peak, 1452. 133 RPM, DSS at this point, very minimal to low. And we're gonna break this down and look at it a little bit slower because at 130 RPM, my eye is not able to pick up a lot out of that. Maybe your eyes are better than mine. Let's go and slow it down a touch here. So now we're playing at 20% uh, of full speed. And so now what we're looking at a little bit here, we have the same over on the right hand side. I've got the right knee X, and then below that the right foot X accelerometer, and then I have the right knee gyro X and right foot gyro X, with again the right foot gyro X telling us about plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. And so we see a bit better coupling of the X uh, Z plane acceleration on the knee and the foot here. They are better coupled. Those peaks are pretty well lined up. That is definitely an improvement in that movement pattern. Taking two of our Kieran sprinters, on the left we have Nita and on the right Fukaya, doing the same 15 second effort. With the LVS, you can compare two things at once and line them up. So again, both of these individuals are producing immense power. 
slowing this down incredibly slow. I look first at just the visual in what's happening. From the data and the video, I am seeing that Nita on the left has a moment of ankle dorsiflexion at the very top of the pedal stroke. And from that point has no further uh, negative gyro X on that right foot where we see a little bit of a delay with Fukaya in that same point at the top of the pedal stroke. And so slight differences then in that beginning of the pedal stroke where they're starting to get that Z plane acceleration of knee and foot effectively where Nita has a little bit better triple extension from the beginning of the pedal stroke all the way through. So slowing things down and taking a look at the data in conjunction with the video is what's important. A few years ago, I had the good fortune to work with a pretty phenomenal rider here. His name is Tom Bonin, who I think yesterday uh, celebrated three years since his uh, last professional victory. Um, but this was way back in about uh, 2011, going into the 2012 season. And we were looking at wheel aerodynamics with Tom here, but what we found was actually there was some opportunity to change some, some set up on his bike by reducing the handlebar width to improve his aerodynamics as well as changing wheels. So occasionally when you start to go into a deep dive, don't be afraid to look at something outside of what you were expecting to find. So as a coach working with time trial athletes, I can pretty much take a large portion of the lab and get out to a velodrome or even out onto the open road, taking a few of these tools out here and get CDA, get physiology data, get then their motion that again in the past was really kind of reserved more for a biomechanics lab, taking the type R and tying together a few of these things. We want to try to help our athletes. A few years ago, I was in the follow car with Rowan out at the uh, 2016 Tour of California individual time trial, which uh, was a very good race for Rowan. He ended up winning that time trial and, and finished second overall. Um, in that race, uh, in GC to uh, Julian Alaphilippe, who won overall. But there was a lot of extraneous motion on his left foot that I was able to kind of see visually here during the race, and it definitely increased uh, as the race went on. And so it was something that I kind of noted, and it was something that we were able to then start looking at and gathering some data with the type R. Not at this point, not at this race, I didn't have the type R, it was not yet available. But that winter, going from 2016 into 26, 2017 season, we were able to do some work and analysis with Rowan and the type R. And sometimes you gotta use what you got. So on occasion you get to go to a wonderful place that's set up and perfectly ready for you to do your best analysis, sometimes you have the garage. Uh, this was this past May, and we were uh, having a challenge of, of getting Rowan set up on the new equipment. We had seen some differences, and, and power production was pretty similar, but his feeling wasn't that he was matched up quite well, and his performances weren't quite matching up to the, to the power output. So there were a couple things that we were looking at here in our garage fitting session uh, with Rowan, and again, Sometimes it's not as glorious as it may be working with, uh, with an athlete. This is the garage and uh, uh, Rowan had to babysit uh, his son. His wife had to get some work done. And so uh, myself and one of our other uh, friends were there to help, you know, keep everything all going forward at once. What we were looking at with Rowan specifically was if we move from a 175 crank, which was his typical crank length, down to a 170, 
was he going to have any change in movement patterns first? That's what we did in the garage. And so we put the type R and we we're able to gather and look at dead spot score. And clearly at a similar power output, the shorter crank was reducing dead spot score. Power output and everything else, you know, pelvic angle 40.7, 40.7, some of the other motion uh, was minimally to no different. Plus or minus half a degree is pretty much no change. And so that was okay. His feelings on the trainer was it felt okay to produce that kind of power because, you know, your first order of business trying to make an athlete faster is make sure you don't make them slower. And so we were able to reduce that DSS and also have a little bit of a decrease in some of that extraneous motion. And so again, like all, like what happens in the real world, we were setting up the uh, LVS system and unfortunately had some communication errors, which are now uh, fixed. There is a bulk export function where you can capture the data and the type R data uh, separately and then sync them after. At the time, we didn't quite have that set up. It was released just a couple of weeks later. And so now you wouldn't have the problem like we had here in the real world. But pedaling with the 175s and then with the with the 170s, we were able to get some qualitative information and data. And again, from the front and the side, able to do the same analysis and looking at what's going on. Were we able to reduce some of that extraneous motion? And then importantly, we had to validate the power output out in the field with that change in crank length and, and small change in position. Was there any net impact on CDA and speed for a given power? And it was something that we were able to confirm in our testing and even better yet in the race, which is kind of the ultimate test. Well, Ron did win the first stage at the Tour of Switzerland and uh, ended up finishing second overall in that entire stage race. Uh, which was a pretty good result if you consider who did uh, win that. Uh, went on later to win the Tour de France this past year. So another example of how we've used the Leomo Type R and the LBS system is uh, with a female time trial athlete that I've coached for several years. Uh, this is Julie Emmerman and uh, this past year she got a new time trial bike so she we have data from her old bike, her old Cannondale there in the upper left, and we've been using that and been honing and dialing in her position. Over the past couple of years, we got a new bike, and so she had some goals this year. And, you know, Julie is quite a, a talented and strong athlete. She did uh, win the Leomo 15-minute time trial here, which was done on a road bike earlier this past spring. Uh, she was uh, eighth place at the U.S. Pro Time Trial, and... Julie is actually 50 years old. So she's not your average, you know, 20 some year old out at the US Pro. She is 50 years old. She has uh, some pretty phenomenal performances though and, and continues to perform well. And there was the US Masters National Championships race here in Colorado in August. And uh, we looked at the, where the records were. And in addition to the potential of winning a uh, Masters National title, there was a 40K time trial record that we saw in the 50 plus category that looked to be vulnerable based on the kind of power output and speed that we know Julie could produce. So with this, we wanted to again, compare some of the old data to current data. And so we bring her into the lab on her new TT bike and assess things and, and take a quick look at real time speed, what's going on, on this over on the right hand side, again, I, I like this is kind of my typical setup. I'll look on the left side first, I'll have power, cadence, then dead spot score, and then foot angular range left, right, and then down the middle, I'm gonna look more at the torso. So I've got pelvic angle and torso angle. So she's around 20 or so degrees, 21 and a half degrees on average here for this segment for her uh, pelvis angle and about uh, 8.7 degrees on average for her torso angle. And then we also have a, a pelvic rotation and torso rotation down below there. Over on the right side then, this is again looking at the foot 
and me and what's going on? Is there a good coupling of those movements of Z plane acceleration of the knee and then the uh, gyro of knee and the x-axis as well as then gyro of x-axis on the foot. Uh, keep in mind that those values are on the left foot and left knee because we were using one of the torso centers so we didn't have the right. Um, so next one. Now we switch over to the left side because when we were going to go out side we were going to be uh, driving here in the u.s which means uh the athlete is going to be off to our right side and so i want or off to our right side so we'd be looking at our left side so i wanted to make sure that the lds data that i was going to be looking at and comparing to then was going to be on the left side and so scale down a couple of these things here but looking at the left knee acceleration and left foot acceleration we see that they do line up well here and one thing i'm going to note right here that left foot about the three o'clock position that is the maximum rate of acceleration in the z plane of the foot that's great to see we want them hitting that kind of peak power at that point peak acceleration of the foot and then I noticed this little uh, kind of notch on the left foot gyro X. So that's the uh, plantar flexion going on. And so just an interesting uh, movement pattern. And so we see the biggest amount of dorsiflexion occurring right there at the top. So loading up and then kind of maintaining that angle. And then as she continues to go through the pedal stroke down at the bottom, then we get that plantar flexion with, again, a little notch right now. There's peak plantar flexion, a slight reduction as the foot's moving back, and then a little bit greater right there before moving then into the dorsiflexion as we move up and over the top. And this is playing back at a very, 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 slow rate. If you notice over here on the right at 0 0.02 uh, from, from normal time, so 2% yeah, actual speed. So next thing we do is we get out, get a, uh, a skilled driver for the car. Note I am not driving the car and capturing this. I would never recommend doing such a thing. So make sure you have a driver driving the car as you are capturing your athlete out in the field. We have a wide road where we can see and be clear ahead and gather and look at her actual riding data. And again, at real speed, there's maybe a little bit less that we're able to pick up. So we're gonna go ahead and slow down everything here. And so now do we see the same things occurring out in the field? Well, a couple things, we see that knee and foot Z acceleration lining up, that's good. So that extension is occurring well triple extension going on and we see that continued little bit of a notch so she doesn't move differently in that plantar and dorsiflexion indoor versus outdoor, which is again a confirmation. In some cases, you may see some differences between how somebody rides on the trainer versus how they ride outside. So taking things outside I believe is really important if you're starting to, to dial in and take a deep dive. With Julie, we've done a lot of different things. Uh, she has some differences in foot range of motion, which you can see here. Uh, if you look on average uh, for this segment, 58.5 on the left and 52.3 on the right. Uh, we have done a few different examinations of changing crank length, one side versus another, and doing some cleat shifts. We've gone back to using bilaterally the same length crank, but our next series of, of evaluations are going to be looking at her cleat placement and seeing the impact on her movement and power production. So in some cases, 
you were able to pull out and identify something that's not going to be helpful. And then in other cases, you just come up with more questions. And that's kind of the thing for me. We sometimes answer one question, and then now I come up with three new questions that we need to answer. Um, with the work that we've done with Julie, well, she went out there at the, at the Masters Nationals, and she was one of three people who did set a new record uh, there. And as you see on the USA Cycling website, her time for 40K of 5508.68 seconds is the new uh, women's 50 plus uh, Masters National record for a 40K time trial. Last thing here, if you take a look on this, uh, this was from the Kristen, uh, the Chrono Kristen Armstrong time trial uh, this past July, where Chloe Digert, uh, one of our uh, top female cyclists in the US, did take the win. Uh, and I think that was an Olympic silver medalist there in second from the 2016 Olympics. Uh, and Julie was fourth place there. If you take a look at the name, uh, just three seconds behind Julie in that time trial is Vittoria Busi. For those of you who know track cycling, well, uh, Vittoria Busi did break Evelyn Stevens' hour record uh, earlier this year. And so by about uh, just a little bit. So, you know, that might mean that there's another potential project uh, that we may work with uh, Julie on if, if she has the interest. So we talk a little bit about that. And if we're going to go down that road, we will definitely be pulling and looking at that motion that she has on the track because we don't have a lot of track data yet from Julie. So, um, so uh, any other questions? We're happy to field uh, through any of our social media channels. Uh, if you want to send an email to support at leomo.io, uh, we can continue any other discussions you have. Again, this presentation will be listed on all of our social media outlets, including um, on YouTube in its, uh, in its, in its full length uh, form. Um, so please check those out and please uh, don't hesitate to send us any additional questions or discussions if you may have them. Uh, so thank you all for attending and, and thanks to our speaker, Neil Henderson, for um, providing such great insights on some of his methodology with some of the highest uh, performing athletes in the world.